Hey, what's up? So today, 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 we are committing nefarious acts by which I'm, I mean, we're just reading. <laughs> I am grinding Grand Blue Fantasy on the side there, and I figured we could have a goofy little game where you uh, maybe try to figure out how much I'm cutting out as a consequence of uh, missing portions of the fight on the left, either because I have to reread something or because I start coughing or sneezing like a wild beast. In any case, I made this thread a few months ago. Uh, the exact date was June 9th. And this actually took me a while to write up. It's mostly stuff that I already knew, but it took me a while to write up. And I decided to make a new thread because in the past couple of days, thanks to the 2.5 update, I've seen a lot of people show more interest in wanting to build Yanshi. Now, my initial thread actually got flagged by spam filters for some reason, and it was effectively this post, but a little less detailed. So I actually asked if I could post the thread in the main sub. I got permission, and then I cross-posted it in the hope that it wouldn't get filtered again. Uh, also, I'm glad that I did that because... I don't know why the main sub is red right now. This technically isn't like really difficult to look at or anything, but it really bothers my eyes. I have an astigmatism. In any case, we're going to be reading over this, and uh, I might talk a little bit more beyond what I have written here. And we might even look at the first thread, because there was something in there that I just did not mention, because it's a more general thing. So to hop right in, this first section is basically a TLDR of the original thread with some additional information. So of course he gets compared to Jing Liu, and I actually have both of those characters. I rolled him, I think, at 40 pity on Kafka's banner. I wasn't even remotely trying to get Kafka. Like I had a dream that I rolled him, and I was like, no way. I woke up, I rolled, and I got him, and I was like, oh, okay. Happiness activated. But uh, yeah, I also decided to get Jing Liu later on. I think her story is kind of interesting and whatnot. I'm Curious to see how she's going to be developed, but I ended up using both of them for pretty much the exact same content. Like, if I cleared something with him, I would clear it with her. I would even use both of them on each other's gear and do a lot of testing and stuff. And I came to find that in the vast majority of situations, while there were aspects that maybe became a little bit easier because she has the AoE capability, there were also instances where he had a bit of an edge because he did more damage in single target. Overall, they usually cleared content in the same number of cycles. I think the biggest issue that I noticed was actually Aventurine because Yansheng is kind of fine in that fight. The problem Jing Liu has, though, is something that I was aware of from when I first read over a kit. The fact that she works on a stack system means if she ever has to deal with a boss that forces her to waste her stacks, that can put her in a really, really awkward situation. So that's one thing to be mindful of. The offset with Aventurine, though, is if you can maintain her energy well, she could, like, use her ult and then use a skill to make sure that the die is high enough for her to get the, like, refund. And she can kind of extend her state like that, but it's not always possible for everybody. So that's just, like, a worthwhile consideration. But anyway... Well, Jing Lu has high raw attack and her modifiers are relatively normal. Yan Xing is the inverse where his attack stat is relatively normal, but the collective value of his modifiers is quite high. And that's why I said here that it doesn't seem like he's the inverse on paper. His Ascension 2 and E1 are both additional damage instances that get tacked on to any attack he does when their conditions are met. This means that his basic attack skill, ult, and follow-up attack go from 100% to 20%, 350%, and 50% respectively to a range of 130 to 190 on the basic, 250 to 310 on the skill, 380 to 440 on the ultimate, and 80 to 140 on the follow-up attack, depending on which conditions are met between the A2 and E1. And because his follow-up attack can proc off of his basic skill and ultimate as long as Soul Still Sync is active, this is where some of his damage potential lies. Against Ice Weak enemies at E0, his basic skill and ult with a follow-up proc would be 210, 330, and 460% attack, respectively. Uh, then there's a little bit of a probability thing. If he does 4 attacks while in the Soul Steel Sync state, 
there is an 82% chance or a probability that he'd trigger his follow-up attack two or more times. It's about 47.5% that he'd specifically do two and 17.9% that he'd proc it a single time. This is somewhat comparable to Sinkshui, where the probabilities are in the player's favor, but in practice, they can potentially fail you. He also has the potential to conserve SP by playing for a follow-up attack off of his basic, and we can see that in action in the Billy Billy zero cycle clear that I linked. It's also going to be in the description, but let's actually look at that portion of the video. So here he's going to use his skill. Triggering the turbulence, Bronya is going to pull him up again, and then he's just going to use his basic to clear out the blaze. Pretty good stuff. Highly suggest you check out the video. Again, it'll be linked in the description. I doubt I can put it in an annotation, but if I can, I'll do that as well. Now, similar to Su Shang's sword stance procs, his A2 and E1 are uncategorized damage, so they will not benefit from bonuses that specifically affect the basic attack, skill, ults, or follow-up attacks. So to bolster them, you really just want to focus on damage percent, attack percent, flat attack, and crit. They do still have an element, though, for damage percent scaling purposes, so you're not losing out on anything by using an on-element orb. And this is also why Glamoth is considered his best planner set currently. The gap between it and other options isn't too big, so you can still go for whatever has the best substats, but yeah, that's what the deal with that is. Moving down, this is just a chart of the base modifier and the total modifier with his A2 or E1, or both the A2 and E1 active. Assuming he's E0, his follow up attack can contribute anywhere from 6.6% to 22% of his damage across three skills and one ult. His E1 changes the impact of the follow up attack, making the exact contribution more variable because the damage everything he does shifts based on whether or not the enemy is frozen when a particular attack hits. Also, as I added things, I don't think I talk about this anywhere. His follow-up attack being inconsistent, I think, maybe is a consequence of the fact that it also freezes and consequently does turn on the damage bonus of his E1. Generally speaking, against MOC enemies, they'll, they'll have about 40% effect resistance. He'll only have a 40% chance of landing the freeze, but because it's something you do so much you actually do end up having a reasonable chance of inflicting it. At least once or twice. Next up is his E2. It's a little odd because it doesn't exactly change his solo energy thresholds, but it does have a bit of an impact with team members and if you decide to run him on a planner set like the Pinnacony one. Prior to his E2, one ult and three skills would refund 95 energy. Post E2, this would be 104.5. Triggering two follow-up attacks, which is relatively probable, would be 20 or 22 energy, respectively pushing it to 115 prior to E2 and 126.5 post E2. If he triggers a third follow-up attack, this becomes 125 and 138.5, so if he gets hit once, he can ult. If you have him E2 and you're running him with an E6 Tingyun, one ult, two skills, and a follow-up attack would be... 82.5 energy, allowing Ting Yun to top him off with her 60 energy from her ult. Woho also gives 28, so if you're only using her with him, she'd allow him to hit 140 after one ult, three skills, and a follow-up attack. You're pretty likely to hit two follow-up attacks, so this is quite consistent, but you also have the option of running both Ting Yun and Woho together. And next up, we have the E4, which is 12% ice resistance penetration. This is actually really, really good because low values of resistance penetration are much more impactful than low values of defense ignore. Though defense ignore would allow him to scale even better with Pella without needing something like the quantum set. 
His E6 is pretty similar to Solitary Healing. It seems regardless of who defeats an enemy, it triggers and extends the duration of his ult buff. This allows for him to maintain his buff when clearing trash mobs, thereby giving more value to the SP positive play of using his basics. And I don't talk about this in the thread, I believe, but if you're using Robin teams, right, your supports become capable of getting rid of the trash mobs for you, which also extends the duration of your ult and, you know, potentially allows you to get hit less so you have an easier time maintaining the entirety of your buff rather than just worrying about the crit rate. Aside from that, his A6 always seems to give him 11 speed, even though it's only a 10% speed buff, so you can speed tune him with that in mind. Likewise, Tingyun's E1 gives 22 speed, and Brongya's E2 gives 33 speed. The run that we looked at before actually does utilize Brongya's E2 to make him one action value faster than Pella in their rotation. I don't know how important that was, if at all, but it's a nice little extra thing. Uh, now, for this one, I think I can TLDR this a little bit better since I'm not typing it out. I've been playing games for a bit over two decades now, and in that time, one of the most common guidelines I've seen is to build crit rate and crit damage at a 1 to 2 ratio. It's a perfectly fine thing to do in most circumstances, but it's very important to remember it's only a guideline and there are reasons to forgo it. The main instances you'd ignore the guideline would be characters like Jing Liu or Yan Cheng here because they get so much of a stat in combat that you can build them so that their out of combat stats are much more lopsided. Other reasons would be characters that are non-crit oriented or just off the rails like Kokomi, or if a character class or weapon does a large number of hits and is reliant on crits to trigger their abilities. I should have said and or is reliant, but you get the idea. The example I ended up using is a character that hits 25 times with an ability and they have a 90% crit rate. They'd have a 7.178% chance to crit 25 times and a 76.359 chance to crit 22 times. The reason this matters is because a lot of the time the one to two crit ratio works out because characters that use it don't have particularly high hit counts. This means that even though you do work off the same probability, you're much less likely to see the probability's downsides come up. And if you do, you can easily just reset for better probability. You, you don't have as much RNG to deal with. But with a character that does a lot of hits, you are constantly battling RNG. So if you want to minimize the impact of RNG, you'd want to get your crit rate as high as possible. This is also why in a lot of MMOs, people will go for 100% crit rate and then just progressively amplify their crit damage as best as they can to make their overall damage output as consistent as possible. In the case of Honkai Stario, there's this thing called hit split. And the way this works is the damage modifier of an attack, as well as any toughness damage it does, if it does any at all, is distributed according to this ratio. So Yunqing's basic does a 50%, 25%, and 25% hit. This does have genuinely different values if his basic is level 7, but at level 6, this is literally how his modifier is split. His skill is 4 hits of 25%, so each hit is a 55% attack modifier. His ultimate, A2 and E1, are single hits that deal 100% of their damage, whereas the follow-up attack is a 2 hit with a 30-70 split. So he is also a character that does benefit quite a bit from having higher crit rate, even though he has a couple of things that are just a full singular hit. Now I'm going to be honest, I kind of shit talked Sleep Like the Dead like a week ago or something like that, but then I sat down and I thought about why I was using it in the first place a year ago, and did some calculations, I tried it on the Hunt version of March, and it's really, really consistent on both of them, actually. So, I did some testing 
but I was using my really bad backup phone because I currently have Genshin Impact on my main phone so I can do some exploration stuff before I swap them back. And as a consequence, the best I got is his stat lineup and this screenshot. But I do have a breakdown of what exactly I did. On his first turn, I used his skill, which buffed him from the 47% crit rate that he has out of combat. You can see that on the stat window here, right? To 67%. And I scroll down a little too much. There we go. And he'll gain 30 energy going from 70 to 100. Uh, I did try to make sure to get his energy to 70 before I tested this. So there was that. But as long as one hit fails to crit, Sleep Like the Dead triggers immediately and applies the 36% crit rate buff mid-attack. This is why you see the big crit rate image icon. I don't know why I said that out of order, but yeah, this is why you see the big crit rate icon. Uh, just zooming as if it's activating, because it is activating. This means that any hits after he fails to crit will suddenly be affected by 103% crit rate. So if you have 44% crit rate outside of combat, you have his light cone at S1 and his talent is maxed out, you can get guaranteed crits aside from one hit. Makes him amazingly consistent. Then on the turn following this, the crit buff is still active. So he'll still be at 103% crit rate. You use a skill, or I use a skill rather, I went to 130 energy, and the follow-up attack did proc this time, so we went to 140, and at the end of his turn, the crit rate buff dissipates. Uh, if he does a follow-up attack, it'll leave after the follow-up attack. If you chain his ult, it will either leave after the ult or after the follow-up attack that triggers off of the ult. Instead, I waited until turn 3. We have 67% crit rate, and I ult immediately to gain the 60% crit rate, as well as the crit damage buff. And then I attack with the ult, potentially proccing the follow-up as well. And then afterwards, the ult buff dissipates. Then on turn 4, Sleep Like the Dead is off cooldown, so we start back from step 1. This means if you have his light cone on him, he becomes extremely consistent. And the main thing that his light cone does in terms of his builds, is allow you to focus more on offensive stats. Uh, you could even do something like getting effect hit rate, attack percent, and crit damage specifically. After meeting your crit rate threshold, I would really say going for about 40% crit rate total is all you really need. And that would give you a higher percent chance to proc his follow-up attack. Because even if you only have a single roll into effect hit rate on each piece, if you have an average roll that's like 3.8 times 6, so you have a little bit less than like 24% effect hit rate. And when you have Pella on the team, she adds 10%. So you end up having like a 50% chance or something like that to freeze an enemy with his follow-up attack from that point on, which is actually pretty good. Considering in good situations, you'll be proccing it relatively frequently. So I do talk a little bit more about that. You can just read over the yapping. Uh, and then I just do talk about light cones. Oh, actually, I, I can say this. So this being another probability thing means that with my 67% crit rate, I have a 79.8% chance to crit less than four times. Another way you can think of this is as having an 80% chance or almost 80% chance to trigger the light cone effect. So for the opportunity cost of one non-crit, everything he does aside from that will crit for three turns, if the rotation allows for it. Then at S5, the crit rate bonus matches the, his ult, so you could run him at 20 crit rate outside of combat, which would be 40% post-skill activation, and then, of course, 100% with either his ult or the light cone effect. But this would also bolster your chances of triggering the light cone to 97%. Making it even more consistent by reducing his actual crit rate. But yeah, so he is somewhat oddly designed, but he's not really poorly designed. 
which does lead us into the light cones, which we'll get into once I join another raid. Uh, Sleep Like the Dead we went over already. The biggest con is it lacks the damage bonuses that the other light cones provide. In the Night is really nice. It bolsters the damage of his skill basic and ult. It built with 40% crit rate, so if you were you know, transitioning from Sleep Like the Dead to this, he could easily reach 78% crit in combat with his skill. Due to Ting Yun being a commonly used support, Speed Boots alone allow him to reap the full benefits of the Light Cone during and directly after ult use without wasting substat rolls. The cons are it doesn't affect his A2 or E1, and on lower speed setups it can end up as a stat stick. Now, Baptism of Pure Thought is the highest damage potential of the current Light Cone selection. The cons are you need at least one character that can debuff to reap the full benefits of the Light Cone. It might not seem like that big a deal because Pella exists, but you can't run her on both sides of MOC slash you know, Apocalyptic Shadow. I could have talked about this a little bit more, but you also don't have the greatest uptime on the damage percent buff as good as it is because he only ults like every four turns technically usually, unless you're running him with Ting Yun specifically. So... It's good, it's very strong, but it has some constraints on its output as well. Then we have Swordplay. This is quite similar to Sleep Like the Dead in that it buffs dynamically, so as you're hitting the enemy, it will start stacking up, and that's why you'll notice that your uh, damage increases throughout the skill while you have this equipped. And being 80% damage at S5 makes it somewhat competitive with S1 in the night and S1 Baptism of Pure Thought. The con is it resets stacks on swapping targets and higher crit stat requirements than the alternative since it doesn't give you any. I feel like this is probably the roughest if you're building him as a raw DPS and you're like trying to do your best to have a good crit ratio without relying on his ult. But nonetheless, swordplay is really, really, really good good and a lot of the clears i've seen players from uh cn do do actually use this light cone above other options and i'm assuming it's just because it's really easy to maintain then we have final victor this is a free-to-play light cone that also does ramp dynamically uh, you get two copies of it for doing stuff in pinacone with the birds and using the ult and triggering follow-up attack allows for a better uptime of the passive, but this isn't on the level of performance that Topaz gets from this. And the con is really just that Topaz comparison. It's a bit weaker than Swordplay if you have both, but not noticeably so. This is actually genuinely a very solid light cone, and you potentially could get a bit better damage output from this in comparison to Sleep Like the Dead, because the 20% attack bonus on this does make it effectively like a 707 attack light cone or something like that. And yes, the crit damage scales, but that's not too big of a problem when you're doing that with swordplay as well. Yeah, but it does end up being a li little bit less consistent than swordplay, kind of, sort of. In the regard that, like, swordplay maintains its bonus when you are still hitting a singular enemy. Whereas this one is going to keep resetting at the end of your turn. This is also subject to the stuff that I mentioned earlier, where like if you chain and ult or if the follow-up attack triggers, it doesn't count as your turn ending until that's over. But uh, yeah, that's about it. I did talk a bit about cruising. Cruising is quite good, but I think it ends up being worse than the other options because you can have a difficult time maintaining the attack buff. And you might not always be able to benefit from the below 50% HP crit rate. It's a good option. It's like a very strong all-rounder. I mean, I have Dr. Ratio on it, and apparently he's like top 1% or something. Maintaining the uptime can be a bit rough. As for planar sets, I would honestly just recommend Hunter of Glacial Frost 4-piece. And if you don't have that, go for 2-piece combos. Attack percent and or damage percent ones, but Valorous and the Wheat set are also fair options. Valorous would potentially buff his ultimate. And Wheat is nice because it gives you extra speed. So if you're trying to do attack boots setups, this makes that a little bit easier. 
that's been my main consideration. You can also use the Quantum Set Genius of Brilliant Stars, but I've noticed that its performance is quite similar to Alternatives if you're not against a Quantum Weak Enemy because you won't be getting the full 20% defense down. Pioneer is okay, but the only way he has to trigger it, like the doubling effect, is by freezing an enemy or by giving him something like Topaz's Light Cone, which is an option you can go for, like, totally. But I think, for the most part, you'd stick to the Light Cone options that I talked about above. But yeah, like, against enemies with 40% effect raise, again, his follow attack doesn't have the greatest chance of inflicting freeze. Over repeated uses, it can work out, but... Yeah, you're just not able to actively maintain uptime on this the way that ratio can. Then for planner sets, in order, I would suggest Glamoth, Izumo, Arena, Durin, SSS, and Cell Soto in terms of overall damage output. But I would rate Cell Soto a little bit higher than SSS because the more uh, crit stats that you have available to you from non-substat sources, the better you can utilize your actual substats. And yeah, again, the gaps between these aren't absolutely massive. The main takeaways are Izumo is team specific, and while Duran is strong, it is slow slash inconsistent to ramp in most team comps during on Yunqing. And the majority of his damage is not follow-up attacks, so the damage percent being specifically for follow-ups isn't like wasted, but you don't make as good a use of it as a number of other characters do. It's fine to use in situations where you can ramp it quickly, but generally, use something else. This bit, you can just check the thread or my spreadsheet, which will also be in the description. It's just explaining why building a character for like 160 speed, like if you want to have the full Glamoth effect, isn't really worth it. You lose offensive substats in the process of trying to get like a 6% damage bonus is the exact same reason that you don't really build characters to maximize the effect of Sila's Light Cone in the night. Pretty simple stuff, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of math involved, so prepare to view numbers. Then for team stuff, I only wrote a little bit here. But everything is, from my point of view, doing both 1 to 5 cycle clears and 0 cycle clears, as well as checking out other people's 0 cycle clears for more insights and information. March 7th has always been able to solo sustain him, and I don't really understand why people thought she couldn't. <laughs> like, genuinely one of the most confusing things to me. Uh, at a level 8 trace with 3,000 defense while on Knight of Purity Palace, her shield strength will be just over 2.7k. And while it does boost his hostility, it's not difficult to manage as her ult can be used directly after a boss or elite's first action to disrupt them via freeze, similarly to how Welt is used. Now, Robin is, you know, just really, really strong, but... A big thing with her is you tend to want your slowest character to be around 134 speed. And Yancheng fits that category perfectly because giving him speed boots gives him exactly 134 speed. The reason this matters is because it gives you an action value of 74.9. It'll show up in game as 75. And this means if you can chain her ult to whatever action the 134 speed character takes, the entirety of your team will be able to take a second set of actions at that approximately 75 action value, and then they'll also be able to take a third set of actions at the end of the cycle. So yeah, the fact that he falls into this speed bracket inherently is quite useful and makes utilizing Robin much, much easier for him. Um, for the last four, Pella is good without question. But I think a big thing that people maybe didn't think about with regards to her or Joshua is being on element or just being able to break the enemy's toughness bar to some degree is huge. Toughness bar being intact reduces your overall damage by like 10%. So like that's one factor, but it's also a way to potentially control the enemy, right? If you can break the enemy, 
after their first action. You can delay them and also inflict statuses and stuff like that, right? Hanya is a similar deal to Pella, uh, as Ice Weakness is often paired with Physical, but the SP region is indispensable, and you can even run her with Bronya's Light Cone to further bolster your SP generation, because Hanya has a really, really easy time generating energy since you're going to be spamming her kill usually. Pretty good stuff. Now, Jade is an option I don't think I've seen many people talk about or even try using, but she does allow you to deal with AoE situations if you don't have a Venturine, as Yunsheng does not lose his Soul Steel Sync stacks from ally HP drain effects. And the reason I know this is because I used him together with Jinglu in Simulated Universe way too much. <laughs> and then Hoha feels a bit underrated, especially with how good she is in conjunction with Ting Yun. Um, I've seen, like, straight up, a template for Robin is using Robin with Ting Yun and Hoho. You battery Robin to some degree with the both of them. And there's actually like a Jing Yuan clear that does this. I'll link that in the description so you can watch it. But yeah, like it's really, really good. You can use uh, Yun Ching with this. Of course, you do have to like hope he doesn't get hit basically, but it is what it is at that point, bro. You're trying to do zero cycles. RNG is RNG. Uh, but yeah, that's the full overview of this. The thing that I wanted to talk about from my original thread, though, was this. Supports do the heavy lifting regardless of which character is being used. So it's a bit weird to me how often people will jump to the argument that, oh yeah, this character is carried. Because kind of, yeah, sort of. But that's literally the point of supports existing. There aren't that many characters that are just broken in a vacuum. I think Boot Hill is probably the closest thing to that. Additionally, low investment and high investment have their place in discussions, but I think are misused for topics like this. Way too often, they're brought up to write something off rather than considering the weight of impact, various degrees of investment change things. Oh, I actually did use Boot Hill as an example here. I completely forgot about that. But yeah, the other thing is this. So low investment is often a baseline barometer in live service games, MMOs, and even RPGs when it comes to various aspects of community discussion. It's good for early game due to resources being more limited and even beyond that as a way to judge opportunity cost. Some individuals would even opt to do low investment challenges. All of that is fine, but general discussion oftentimes is heavily imbibed with the consideration of low investment as a baseline to the point it can and does detract from the discussion of a character's kit and utility. It brings the breed of mindset along the lines of why invest in you when I have J. But without necessarily considering what utility or unique aspects you brings to the table. A more explicit example would be how Fu Shuan is a highly valued sustain in part due to the role compression she provides. She might against damage, has a minor heal, confers debuff resistance, and buffs both crit rate and crit damage, assuming you have her E1. So getting and investing in her with a low investment oriented mindset could thus lead to the disinclination to engage with other options regardless of what they provide. To be perfectly clear, part of the reason I use her as an example is because I saw people asking, oh, why should I invest in part? Why should I invest in March? And as I mentioned, March is actually a really, really good sustain because she not only has the single target shielding for a character like this guy but she actively disrupts the enemy japar does as well like i actually wanted japar's e1 and now i have it so a lot of the time when i use his skill he actually just ends up freezing things because he has a 100 percent base chance and then i have moment of victory at like i think it's s2 so it's like 28 percent effect hit rate or something like that and then on top of that, I do have him on some amount of effect hit rate substats. I usually basic with him, but if I need to stop an enemy momentarily, I do that. And I mean, additionally, if I had Yunqing's E1, it could be a way to just turn on the extra damage if I needed it. But yeah, um, I'm going to link the new thread in the description as well. I uh, don't know how long it's going to take me to edit this video, but uh, yeah, hopefully this was enjoyable. And if there's something that 
somebody wants me to write about, give me a heads up.